and that's why I went to uh, work with, or one of the reasons I went to work with uh, Jake Hendrick Jones, my PhD on uh, uh, myosin motors. Uh, but uh, uh, by the time I went to do a postdoc uh, to a, a lab uh, dedicated to the study of mitosis, Dick McIntosh's lab, uh, uh, we appreciated that mitosis depends upon uh, a different class of uh, a cytoskeletal polymer uh, microchip. And uh, in Dick's lab, I joined a, a group of people that included uh, Mary Porter, Bill Saxton is here, Larry Goldstein, uh, Ted Salmon, who is on sabbatical, trying to understand how these motors uh, separate chromosomes. And <clears throat> what we now know is that microtubules are assembled from alpha beta tubulin heterodimers, they assemble in a head to tail fashion, giving the microtubule a structural polarity so that one end, the plus end, is distinct from the uh, other end, the minus end. And because uh, tubulin is a GTPase, uh, 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 and because uh, GTP tubulin subunits tend to assemble on the polymer, uh, whereas GDP tubulin subunits tend to disassemble, uh, the uh, polymer undergoes a process discovered by Tim Richardson called dynamic instability, uh, stochastically switching between phases of assembly and disassembly. And an assembling microtubule can exert uh, pushing forces uh, and a disassembling uh, microtubule can exert pulling forces. And this is important to what I'll say about, uh, micro, about mitosis later on. Um, what we also know, we didn't know then, but we now know, is that these microtubules can serve as tracks uh, for motor proteins called kinesins, uh, which uh, use cycles of ATP hydrolysis to step processively along uh, a microtubule. Uh, the first uh, founding member of the kinesin family was discovered by uh, Ron Bale, uh, working on uh, axonal transport in uh, seminal work, and it's an honor for me that Ron has come up from UCSF to listen to this uh, <laughs> seminar, and it blows me away. <laughs> it's a long way, I hope you're over the jet. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'd like to say that uh, in Dick's lab, uh, uh, we, were, we turned out to purify a very similar protein from sea urchin eggs and embryos, and uh, uh, found, uh, using immunofluorescence, that it localized to the mitotic spindle. Probably our antibodies were reacting with a number of kinesins in the spindle, because we now know that uh, uh, eukaryotic cells contain uh, 14 families of kinesin, kinesin 1 through uh, 14, there may be uh, others, uh, with diverse uh, oligomeric states and uh, biological functions. Uh, so this has been uh, very exciting. And uh, the way, the mechanism by which a kinesin motor steps along uh, a microtubule protocol that's been elucidated uh, beautiful biophysical studies done by Ron and others, uh, where we can consider a kinesin motor uh, whose center of mass is located at subunit uh, N, and it's capable of stepping uh, forward to N plus 1 or backwards to N minus 1. And in the absence of ATP, because the two uh, motor domains or heads of kinesin motor are ATP ASs, in the absence of ATP, the uh, um, activation energy the radius equation, that the rate constant for stepping forward versus backwards is the same, uh, and so the motor tends to step randomly back and forth, undergoing a one-dimensional random walk uh, along the protofilament. Uh, ATP biases this random walk, uh, because when the uh, beta-gamma phosphoron hydride bond is hydrolyzed, it releases a supply of free energy uh, that can uh, tilt this energy landscape in such a way that the rate constant for stepping forward becomes much greater than the rate constant for stepping backwards. So a kinesin 1 motor uh, uh, tends to move uh, processively to the plus end of a microtubule track uh, and not towards the minus end of the track uh, at a rate uh, of about a micron per second. And if it's carried a load, the load constitutes an opposing force and as that force increases actually 
uh, the tilting decreases as energy is used uh, to generate <coughs> force rather than uh, and slow down the motility, giving rise to a force velocity curve such that the motor stalls at a, a, a stall force, a maximum stall uh, a, a force of uh, six pi uh, So this uh, uh, biophysical analysis of uh, uh, motor functions being uh, fascinating uh, for me to uh, follow and read about, uh, but our work's really been involved at uh, uh, a different level, uh, and that is trying to understand how these motors function and cooperate within the context of macromolecular machines, particularly uh, the mitotic spindle, uh, and I'm going to tell a story about how sliding motors cooperate with microtubule polymer dynamics to separate chromosomes uh, during mitosis that we've been working on. But first of all, I want to start on some uh, how, on the topic of how some intracellular, intracellular <coughs> transport motors contribute to the assembly of psyllid. And this is a project that we got into uh, completely by chance when we were uh, looking for uh, mitotic motors. Uh, one of the things I did in my own lab is to follow up on that work in the sea urchin mitotic spindle and uh, make uh, uh, microtubules uh, from uh, sea urchin uh, embryos. And I, uh, this, I'm only showing this slide because this is literally the last experimental work I did myself. <laughs> <laughs> what I've done was to uh, uh, make some uh, pankinesin peptide antibodies, which in lots of these microtubule preparations reacted with multiple potential kinesin polypeptides uh, in the early sea urchin uh, embryo. And it, it, that included this doublet, which turned out to be two subunits of a novel uh, heterotrimeric form of kinesin, the founder member of the kinesin family, which I think was brilliantly um, purified uh, by postdoc. Uh, Doug Cole in the lab and characterized it in molecular terms by Karen Wedden. So Doug started using these uh, peptide antibodies to trace the purification on gels. He made sea urchin egg embryo microtubules, eluted the bound motors, and then fractionated them using traditional uh, biochemical techniques to yield this trimer uh, consisting of two distinct motor subunits whose amino terminal ends form uh, two motor domains capable of stepping along a microtubule linked by a heterodimeric uh, coiled coil to uh, a, a tail where a non-motor accessory subunit, which we call the cap, is localized. Uh, the pure motor moves towards the plus ends of microtubules at about 0.4 microns per second. That corresponds to movement towards the tip of the cilium or away from the spindle couples. Uh, but when uh, Bob Morris was a postdoc in the lab, he micro-injected um, monoclonal antibodies to block the function of this protein. Uh, and what he found was that mitosis and cell division occurred normally. The uh, fertilized egg developed into a blastula. But whereas controls show uh, assemble these long motile cilia, only short uh, stubs of paralyzed cilia formed uh, when kinesin 2 function was inhibited leading us to propose that heterotrimeric kinesin 2 required the cilia genesis. And I would probably have left the project and gone uh, uh, purely to mitosis. Uh, novel motor, uh, novel kinesin motor required the cilia genesis. That seemed like a good jumping off point. Uh, if it weren't for some beautiful work done uh, in Joel Rosenbaum's lab on uh, Clamidomonas, uh, so by flagellate or by ciliate, uh, uh, alga, green alga, and in Joel's lab uh, up at Yale, uh, Keith Kosminski, a graduate student, discovered a process called intraflagellar transport, which is required for cilia genesis. And uh, in intra, during intraflagellar transport, multimeric uh, uh, protein complexes called IFT particles are transported from the cytoplasm to the uh, tip of the cilium, uh, uh, and what uh, Keith uh, showed uh, subsequently was that mutations in one of the subunits in the homologue of uh, kinesin 2 uh, led to a cessation of this transport, suggesting that kinesin 2 transports these IFT particles from the cy cytoplasm along the ciliary microtubules underneath the membrane to the distal tip. Uh, subsequently, uh, Dawn Singer in my lab 
as well as Mary Porter and uh, George Whitman's lab, shows that his IFT particles are recycled by IFT dining. Actually, one important thing that, that Dawn showed, uh, and I'm not going to talk about this except to say that Dawn showed that uh, kinesin 2 at the tip actually undergoes turnaround. Uh, it is converted from a driver to a passenger and is recycled back to the cell body by an IFT dining. Conversely, we now know that dining is transported to the tip by this uh, antrobrain pathway. And so that gives rise to this constant bidirectional uh, streaming, uh, uh, um, which is required to assemble and maintain cilia and flagella. And so this was very interesting, and uh, we couldn't uh, in the lab pass it up. Um, and there were really two aspects of this system that I wanted to focus on testing uh, in, in our lab. And that is the idea that kinesin 2 does indeed transport these IFT particles from the base to the tip, because there's a kind of dirty uh, little secret that the Plami community don't tell us, don't talk about very often, and that is that the uh, rate of anthrograde IFT in vivo is an order of magnitude faster than the rate at which kinesin 2 purified from any source uh, moves uh, in motility assays. And secondly, we wanted to uh, determine if IFT particles carry tubulin subunits and to the uh, distal tip for their assembly, and that's why this process is required for ciliogenesis. Uh, Gerald's lab had shown very nicely that um, um, uh, tubulin doesn't indeed assemble at the distal uh, tip of the cilium, but that could be due to many different mechanisms, bacterial flagella, purified tubulin, uh, assemble uh, at their distal tip uh, without a requirement for this kind of transport system. So we decided to further investigate this uh, process uh, as a model for motor cargo transport uh, using Xenorhabditis uh, elegans, a model organism introduced by the great molecular biologist uh, by Sidney Brunner. And the work in our lab uh, on this project was started by Dawn Sigma and Karen Wedderman uh, with a lot of fantastic advice on the genetics of the system and so on from uh, Leslie Grove and the lab. Uh, so in this uh, organism uh, where uh, Dawn's lit up, the, the reporter lit up the entire nervous system, um, uh, sensory cilia uh, occur on the distal dendritic endings of chemosensory neurons. And these uh, sensory cilia detect chemicals in the environment and send signals back uh, through this network of neurons to the body wall muscles to control the chemotactic movements of the animal. These sensory cilia are actually organized into two bundles called as uh, amphids in the head, phasmids in the tail, where each bundle is shown in this cross section done uh, actually by Kent McDonald and James Evans. Um, uh, there are uh, 10 uh, cilia per bundle, and uh, here, We've seen a bundle like this in longitudinal section by uh, fluorescence uh, microscopy there, uh, illuminated with a, a, a marker. And the one thing I want to draw your attention to is that so each of these is uh, an individual cilia. Within each of these cilia, there are nine microtubules in a, uh, a ring. And longitudinally, they're differentiated into two domains, uh, a domain containing microtubule doublets, uh, called the middle segment, and a domain uh, containing uh, distal singlets. And these two domains, con we, uh, Lin Howe in the lab show, contain different tubulin isotypes. For example, uh, 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 alpha tubulin TBA5 is specific to this distal segment. <coughs> so, um, why, why would you care about this? Well, the reason that uh, we care is that uh, most cells now uh, are known to contain a structure called a primary cilium, uh, which can detect signals in the environment and uh, 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 control gene expression and cell function. And uh, there's uh, some evidence that this bidirectional transport system is required uh, to deliver uh, some of this, these signals to the nucleus and the cytoplasm to control many important aspects of cell and developmental biology. Many of you heard Catherine Anderson talking about hedgehog signaling, uh, which controls pattern in the embryo last week, for example. And uh, these distal singlets 
are a common feature of these primary or sensory cilia. For example, in your own retina, uh, the, uh, which is a modified cilium, uh, the uh, uh, um, axoneme contains a region of doublets and then these very elaborate uh, singlets. And it's thought that these singlets may be actually signaling domains that uh, contain chemoreceptors, uh, opsin, that uh, at least control the uh, localization of chemoreceptors, op opsins, cyclic nucleotide uh, gated channels, and so on within uh, the ciliary membrane. Uh, so we think of these distal singlets as being important for uh, signaling. And uh, I'm going to jump forward several years to a paper we published three years ago now, uh, in which uh, Linnin and co workers. Uh, provided the first evidence that in C. elegans, um, uh, IFT delivers a tubulin isotype to the tips of the sensory uh, cilia middle and distal uh, signals. Uh, this work is now being uh, extended actually very nicely in climbing and monus where the uh, IFT uh, uh, particle uh, responsible for binding tubulin has been uh, crystallized. So uh, one of the first things that Dawn found uh, when she uh, began working on this system, is that C. elegans cilia contain uh, actually two distinct forms of kinesin 2. One, a heterotrimeric form, equivalent to the uh, prototypic C. urchin protein, and also a homodimeric form, which is the product of a different gene, so it's a heterotrimeric form, homodimeric form. And uh, work done uh, subsequently in my lab, uh, in the Vale lab, and by Zeynep Berkton and colleagues in Germany, uh, showed that these two motors have different properties. Uh, uh, heterotrimeric kinesin 2 is a, a slow, less processive motor than uh, the homodimeric form. So given all the information I, I told you, I bet you would bet, and I would have bet, that with these two motors and two sites of assembly of tubulin, one motor delivers tubulin subunits to the tips of the middle segment and the other to the tips of the distal singlet. That's the way we would probably design it, but it doesn't work that way. And so uh, the reason we know that is through looking at mutants in uh, the two uh, motors uh, by uh, fluorescence microscopy and also serial section EM done in collaboration with uh, Kenton and James, actually we just shown sections through the middle and distal singlets here for example. And so in wild type worms, the cilia are full length, they have intact and middle and distal singlets. In the absence of heterotrimeric kinesin 2 function, the cilia are still full length. If we specifically uh, uh, are lacking the activity of the homodimeric mutant, there's a specific loss of distal singlets, the doublets are still there. And then uh, in double mutants, uh, then the entire axon is gone. And so that tells us that the heterotrimeric and homodimeric dimeric forms redundantly build the middle segment and the homodimeric kinesin 2 specifically assembles the distal singlet. So what's the role of uh, IFT in this process? Well, to uh, test this, a, a very talented um, technician in the lab, Jose Arozo, uh, and then uh, uh, Josh Snow, graduate student at Guangzhou Wu, who now is his own lab in China, actually went to Wan's lab for a, a postdoc and then got his own lab in China, uh, used uh, one of the features of C. elegans that's very useful, the ability to make GFP tag motor or IFT particles and uh, visualize the movement of the motors and the particles in living cell cilia. So here's the base of the cilia in these IFT assays, and you can see multiple uh, IFT particles streaming uh, towards the tip. There's actually also retrograde movements that are less obvious in this video. And with uh, Ingrid's imaging uh, techniques, we uh, improved this assay, we use chemographs, which are plots of uh, distance as a function of time, so the slope measures the velocity, to track the movements of these IFT particles in a, a living organism, in a living uh, world. And what Guangzhou noticed was something very interesting. That is that as the IFT particles uh, are streaming along the uh, cilia, uh, they accelerate. So that along the middle segment, they move at point, uh, uh, 0.7 microns per second. 
but along the distal singlets, they accelerate to 1.3 microns per second. In the absence of homodimeric kinesin 2, the particles only move at about 0.5 microns per second. There are no uh, distal singlets but to move on anyway. And then uh, mutants lacking the heterotrimeric uh, kinesin move at this at fast rate all along the cilia. And this, I mean, in you know, double mutant, there are no axonemes, so there's no motility. Uh, and so, in fact, this movement is characteristic of the rate of heterotrimeric kinesin 2. And this is characteristic of the rate of uh, homodimeric kinesin 2, leading us to speculate that this intermediate rate uh, was due to competition between these motors on the same particles. Uh, to test this, we uh, show you Pan was a student in the lab. We used uh, motility assays of the type that Vale had used to uh, initially isolate that uh, uh, kinesin in which the in this case, kinesin 2 motor is adsorbed to the cover slip. That tricks the motor into thinking the cover slip is uh, uh, cargo. It can't move the slide, so instead it moves microtubules at its characteristic rate with the minus end lead. And so, uh, for the heterotrimeric uh, kinesin 2 alone, uh, the rate is about uh, uh, 0.4 microns per second, very similar to the rate uh, seen in the absence of homodimeric kinesin. Uh, to uh, with homodimeric kinesin to uh, the rate is much faster, about uh, 1.2 microns per second, similar to the rate uh, of movement along the distal singlet. And then uh, intermediate uh, 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 mixtures of concentrations of osm3 to kinesin to hetero, so osm3 is the homodimeric kinesin to. Uh, uh, mixtures of this with the heterotrimeric form give this nonlinear uh, response, and it, whereas at a, a one to one molar ratio approximately, we see rates of uh, 0.7 <coughs> microns per second. So, summarizing these data, um, uh, the first thing we can say is that in this system there's very good agreement between the in vivo rates and the in vitro rates, and the uh, uh, so unlike in Panigamomus, the rates are highly consistent. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, we uh, proposed a, a model in which IFT particles carrying tubulin subunits and other cargo to, uh, are carried together by heterotrimeric and homodimeric kinesin along from the cytoplasm, uh, along the uh, middle segments. At the tip of the middle segments, tubulin subunits are unloaded and add on uh, to the tips. Uh, heterotrimeric kinesin 2 uh, uh, undergoes turnaround, <coughs> associated and goes turnaround and is carried back by dynein, uh, whereas, um, osm, uh, whereas homodimeric kinesin 2 carries the particles the rest of the way to the distal tip. So this is a very unusual pathway in which both motors, <coughs> the slow motor exerting drag on the fast motor and vice versa, carry the <coughs> particles together uh, and then uh, following this rearrangement, the homodimeric motor carries them the, the rest of the way. Uh, and so, uh, rather than acting independently as we would have guessed, you get this very unusual pattern. And what was, what's been really missing uh, in our understanding of this pathway is why bother using two motors like this? What's the point? Is the velocity of 0.7 microns percent important for severe event control or something? Some in the number of subunits that get there. We thought about lots of things and never really knew the answer uh, until some work done by uh, Erwin uh, Peterman's lab uh, by uh, his graduate student, Bram Krieger. And as some of you know, Bram uh, 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 Erwin, who's a biophysicist by the way, uh, uh, sent Bram over uh, to our lab for a year uh, to learn this system. And uh, actually, had a great year. He not only learned the system, picked up a great uh, thesis project. Uh, he also met his wife, Danya Shuram. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a productive time. <laughs> uh, anyway, what, uh, this amazes me. I mean, what uh, Owen's an, an alum of the murder lab, a single molecule fluorescence microscopy. And what Bram's been able to do in his lab is monitor the behavior of single fluorescently labeled heterotrimeric kinesin 2 in cilia of a living work. So all the previous assays were done 
an assembly. And so actually there are two um, individual motors uh, moving along here that can tract on the right, and one of them undergoes turn around here. So here's the base of the cilium, and the, the tips of the middle segment are about here. And you can see these individual motors uh, uh, being tracked and then undergoing turn. So, uh, and I really wish uh, Steve Kay was uh, in town to, to witness this. I think that um, visualizing uh, Kinesin 2 motors in a living organism is a massive accomplishment. But what does it tell us? Well, uh, uh, what it tells us is that, in fact, it's not uh, quite the way that we uh, suppose. So one thing uh, uh, that I uh, didn't tell you is that around the base of the cilium is a complex array of uh, cross-links uh, uh, to the basal body, to the transitional fibers, to the Y-shaped cross-linkers, to the ciliary necklace uh, in the transition zone. And this complex network of proteins thought to control the import of molecules uh, into the cilia. And then here's the, bit of the middle segment of the distance. And so by tracking heterotrimeric kinesin 2 and homodimeric kinesin 2 uh, in green and uh, violet, uh, respectively, in, in individual worms, and then uh, looking at the, uh, these motors as they undergo turnaround and recycling. Uh, what's very clear is that, in fact, the heterotrimeric form uh, spends most of its time negotiating this very complex transition zone. In the middle segment, rather than moving at a unitary rate of 0.7 microns per second, the IFT particles actually slowly accelerate. The mean rate is about 0.7, uh, but they actually accelerate. And the middle segment is therefore thought of as a handover zone in which kinesin 2 is exchanged, in which heterotrimeric kinesin 2 is exchanged for homodimeric kinesin 2. And, uh, and then the faster, more processive homodimeric kinesin 2 takes the IFT particles uh, the rest of the way. Uh, so uh, uh, this is where uh, this uh, project is. Uh, it looks as though actually heterotrimeric kinesin 2 is really an import motor that gets the IFT machinery into the cilia and then long range transport is by the faster, uh, more processive homodimeric kinesin 2. Uh, and to me, it's going to be very exciting to uh, follow uh, Irwin's work as it develops because this approach really uh, offers the opportunity of getting at the uh, biophysical mechanism of uh, motor cargo transport in this system. I think at the single molecule. So um, I'll end there and, and spend uh, uh, on uh, ciliogenesis and just spend the last uh, 15 minutes uh, talking about my uh, favorite subject, mitosis, which we study in the Drosophila in there. And we actually, when we started working on this system, we got a lot of help from both uh, Bill Sullivan and Bill Saxton uh, in uh, getting the system up and running in the lab. And uh, we like the uh, syncytial embryo, uh, which arises from a fertilized egg uh, through a series of nuclear divisions and migrations to give rise to a single cell containing a monolayer of uh, uh, nuclei lying uh, just underneath the cell surface. And in this uh, system, uh, and it is very large because uh, these, uh, showing this transgenic worm that Ingrid made, uh, these um, uh, mitotic spindles separate chromosomes uh, within relative synchrony. So we can study the dynamics of the process at a very high spatial and temporal resolution. And uh, we like to have a, a large M uh, for high fidelity studies. And so these spindles actually assemble by a centrosome directed pathway in which the centrosomes separate. Uh, uh, nucleate the assembly of dynamically unstable microtubules which capture chromosomes, maneuver them onto the uh, uh, um, metaphase spindle equator so that pairs of cystic chromatids are facing opposite spindle poles. All these microtubules have their plus ends pointing outwards. Um, the chromatids <coughs> are separated as a result of disassembly of these kinetical microtubules. In, Prosopha embryos has been studied very nicely by my former student and uh, postdoc Greg, Greg Rogers and Dave Sharp, uh, respectively, <coughs> and in a process called uh, anaphase A. And then uh, chromosomes are separate, separated 
also by a process called anaphase B, in which the uh, spindle uh, elongates, pulling the chromosomes uh, further apart, uh, either by uh, pulling forces on the cell cortex, I'll just tell you in the Drosophila embryo, uh, by, uh, uh, we by sliding motors acting at the spindle mid zone. And the idea that uh, uh, microtubules uh, slide uh, during uh, anaphase B was uh, uh, really suggested by a beautiful uh, serial section uh, EM done by McDonald and, and in, in the Macintosh lab, like my microscopy done by Zach Candy and uh, Bill Saxton, who was in the next lab as well. Uh, and uh, our lab uh, really uh, made a, a significant advance in understanding this uh, um, sliding filament mechanism, I think, when Ingrid uh, used a technique developed by Claire Waterman Stora and Ted Salmon called fluorescent speckle microscopy to label uh, embryonic spindles uh, with speckles of excess fiduciary marks to monitor the dynamics of uh, uh, microtubules within the spindle, uh, as you can see here. And so then if you monitor the behavior of these tubular speckles uh, along uh, an interpolar microtubule bundle, which is anti-parallel at the equator and parallel uh, towards the poles, and then look again using chemographs uh, here, uh, uh, what is seen is, is best uh, illustrated on this uh, cartoon. Uh, what Ingrid finds is that during metaphase and anaphase A, while the uh, spindle maintains a constant length as the chromosomes are moved to the poles, these tubulin speckles flux polewards at about 0.05 microns per second. But at the onset of anaphase B, uh, the flux stops, and in fact, the uh, speckles move away from the equator at the same rate as the spindle parts. So uh, that is half uh, 0.05 microns per second, uh, so that the uh, two spindle poles move apart at 0.1 microns per second. So this was consistent with a very simple model, uh, which we now refer to as the slide and flux or elongate model, or the safe slide and flux or elongate model, the safe model, because it's a safe part of the bed that there's room for improvement, <laughs> as, as in all models. <laughs> um, in which we propose that uh, uh, microtubules are persistently slid apart by uh, motors at the mid zone, and <coughs> during metaphase and, and uh, anaphase A, a period that we refer to as pre anaphase B. Uh, these sliding microtubules are depolymerized on the spindle poles, uh, and so sliding is balanced by depolymerization. There's no net force on the spindle poles, and so the spindle maintains a constant length. But when this uh, depolymer the, the, the depolymerization at the poles is turned off, now this allows the outwardly sliding motors to exert pushing forces on the spindle pole and drive anaphase B spindle elongation. So. <coughs> Um, the, what's the motor that we think drives this uh, sliding at the mid zone? Uh, well, again, uh, Doug uh, in the lab uh, purified uh, a, a, a motor by making Drosophila embryo microtubules and gels, uh, uh, fractionating the, the uh, 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 eluted uh, microtubule associated proteins and probed them on blocks with the pancreas and peptide antibodies. Like I talked about, and ended up purifying this high stokes radius protein here, which moved towards the plus ends of microtubules at 0.05 microns per second, exactly the rate of a polar flux. What was interesting about this motor was that based on stokes radius and S value, uh, it behaved as a homo tetramer of four identical kinesin related polypeptides. Uh, Doug noticed that the motor had a very annoying bundling behavior when he was purifying the protein, which was a nuisance. But when uh, Anna Kashina came to the lab in uh, two papers, uh, she uh, uh, looked by rotary shadow EM uh, and found that these uh, individual motors, a dumbbell shaped molecules with blobs on either end of a rod, and uh, these blobs could be decorated with motor domain specific. Uh, antibodies, mm -hmm. uh, suggesting that this was a bipolar homo tetram 
and uh, uh, leading to this uh, kind of uh, model uh, uh, where uh, essentially there's the equivalent of uh, two kinesin one uh, diamonds in an anti-parallel organization giving rise to these uh, bipolar mini films. And grad student uh, uh, Lee Tao uh, started uh, looking at this uh, in a beautiful job of using the baclovirus system to purify this protein. I actually sent him over to uh, Erwin Peterman's lab in, in a previous um, uh, collaboration where he showed using polarity mark microtubules that uh, this motor, which turns out to be called uh, Neeson 5, um, uh, uh, can cross the microtubules into either parallel or anti-parallel orientations with a threefold preference for the anti-parallel or orientation. And when it crossed into microtubules in uh, motility <coughs> assays pioneered by Lucas Capitain in uh, Irwin's lab, uh, uh, it can slide micro one microtubule against another by walking along both microtubules in crosswinds. So, uh, for many years, uh, I've been very, this uh, sliding filament mechanism in which this motor is proposed to uh, cross and can slide apart anti-parallel microtubules uh, to get, generate outward forces uh, in the spindle. Uh, is, this is a unique oligomeric architecture, and we wanted to know what causes it to assemble into this unique architecture. And this, it turns out, was solved by really by uh, Jordan uh, Alva Sam's lab, I'll just mention this very briefly, I can't do it justice. Um, in a multi-UCD lab effort, Shada Ajar, a postdoc in the lab, uh, Dave Carlson worked with labs like John Ross's lab and, and uh, Julie Leary's lab and uh, others uh, to identify uh, what we refer to as the uh, bipolar assembly domain in the middle of the Kinesin 5 rod. Uh, my daughter, uh, elder daughter, Jessica, my younger daughter, Emma's here, <laughs> uh, Jessica was uh, uh, taking a year between uh, 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 physics undergrad at Berkeley and going off to UPenn where she is today, <coughs> Chile, Philadelphia. Uh, uh, and uh, Jessica worked with Stanley uh, Nithyanantham uh, in uh, uh, Jordax Lambert under Jordax Excellent Supervision. Uh, they actually obtain a, a crystal structure uh, for this domain, uh, which suggests that it's a novel uh, four helix bundle that, that organizes the motor into this uh, uh, unique bipolar orientation uh, uh, this uh, microtubule motors. And again, this is going to be very exciting for me to follow because uh, uh, it allows Jordan the possibility of getting an atomic uh, model of this kind of sliding filament mechanism. So that's uh, really very exciting for you to watch. Um, so what does it do? What does Kinesium 5, what does this Kinesium 5 driven sliding filament mechanism do in the spin? Well, it turns out that quite early on, when uh, Ania sequenced uh, the protein, uh, we realized that this protein had been described a couple of years earlier in several uh, genetic systems. It hadn't been purified or characterized biochemically before. Uh, first of all, by Anne-Marie Enos in Ron Morris's lab. Ron Morris is a postdoc advisor, by the way. And the characteristic phenotype of loss of kinesin 5 fun uh, uh, function mutants was collapsed spindles, suggesting that this motor can push apart uh, spindle parts. Uh, in our lab, we studied the motor uh, using, uh, the motor's function in vivo using antibody microinjection, first by Dave Sharp. And then, uh, I think in very elegant studies by uh, Ingrid Busnasher, who's able to tease out the range of functions of these motors in the following way. What she does is she takes a transgenic fly made by uh, Dania in the lab, expressing uh, GFP uh, green uh, kinesin 5, and uh, uh, also uh, rhodamine tubulin to label uh, microtubulin. This is functional based on mutant rescue. What she then does is introduces an antibody, microinjects an antibody here into the syncytial. Here the concentration of antibody is high and it fully dissociates kinesin 5 from spindles into the cytoplasm where it forms these green uh, immunoprecipitates. Because it's a syncytial, the antibody diffuses to form a concentration gradient uh, so that here the concentration of antibodies is low and there's sufficient 
residual kinesin-5 uh, for it to uh, carry out normal mitosis. And so this is equivalent to an allelic series of mutants, a strong phenotype, weak phenotype. And you can see that uh, in this uh, video where you can see that here, the strong phenotype, all the kinesin-5 has gone from the spindle, and you see that the spindle collapses, whereas down here there's enough green kinesin-5 for normal mitosis. And right in the middle of this, what uh, um, Ingrid was able to find was an inhibition of uh, 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 polar flux and anaphase B spindle elongation. Uh, so uh, I'll just mention that we also know that kinesin 5 can't uh, do the anaphase B part alone. This is work from Hai Fang Wang, and, uh, my last uh, graduate student who just came out in uh, NBC, I think this week or last week. And uh, here, uh, Hai, uh, 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 um, Hai Fang has studied functional cooperation between kinesin 5 and a non motor anti parallel microtubule microtubule cross link called FEO which is a member of the ACE1P family, first described in, in yeast. And, and so here you're looking at a transgenic embryo expressing both uh, red FEO and green uh, kinesin 5. It's a living embryo, but here's a still from it during anaphase B, because FEO goes on to the spindle specifically at the onset of anaphase B. So if she traces uh, an interpolar microtubule from one pole along an interpolar microtubule bundle, uh, to the other pole uh, and uses uh, EB1 comets to track the anti-parallel overlaps at the mid-zone, what she finds is that kinesin 5 is all, all the way along the uh, interpolar bundle, except at the set right of the equator within the overlap zone, it's still there, there's way more than there is uh, in, the, in the background uh, region, but there's a dip in the intensity, uh, because this is occupied by the anti-parallel crosslink fear. And when we use that same technique to dissociate FEO from uh, the spindle, then we get uh, mitotic spindle, so here are controls, is the FEO depleted uh, spindle uh, microtubules, uh, chromosomes. Uh, what we see is only, uh, compared to controls, very, very disorganized uh, central spindles that actually become fully occupied with kinesin 5, which takes the place of FEO. Uh, but they uh, undergo only very slow anaphase B to about 50% normal, and as you can see, uh, chromosomes are not uh, fully segregated. Uh, so uh, that's where we are on that end of the model, uh, with uh, persistent uh, kinesin 5 driven uh, uh, sliding filament mechanism uh, uh, involved in cooperation with an H1P family member uh, to elongate the spindle. But how is, uh, if, but in this model, we have polar flux going on here due to depolymerization of the spindle poles, which then gets turned off to allow spindle elongation. How is depolymerization turned on and off? Well, this it, uh, it depends on uh, kinesin 13 motor, uh, which has unusual properties. Uh, and it's been characterized in Tim Richardson, Claire Wells, and Linda Waterman. Joe Howard and Dave Sharp's one, uh, not by our one, uh, by the chemical of this. And what this motor does is that when it attaches to the microtubule polymer lattice, going back to this reaction coordinate diagram again, instead of using ATP hydrolysis to step along the lattice, it uh, uh, undergoes this one dimensional uh, uh, random walk until it finds either the plus or the minus ends of the microtubule, then it hydrolyzes ATP to dissociate uh, tubulin subunits. So it's a microtubule depolymerase. And inhibiting it causes mitotic spindles to get abnormally long. I think that was first shown uh, in, in Tinder. And so what uh, I found it was to make uh, a transgenic fly uh, expressing kinesin 13, uh, where you can see that it's localized uh, uh, very clearly around the mitotic spindle. And she then also took advantage of uh, work by Dania, uh, based on studies done in Pat O'Farrell's lab at UCSF, who showed that progression through mitosis depends upon the degradation of three cyclins, uh, with cyclin B being required for progression through anaphase uh, B. So what Dania did uh, was to look at uh, spindle dynamics here in a wild type, 
which forms a metaphase spindle, segregates its chromosomes, and then elongates during uh, anaphase B. She found that uh, flies containing high levels of non-degradable cyclin D uh, 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 assemble a metaphase spindle fine. They segregate chromosomes with a delay, but they never undergo anaphase B spindle elongation, uh, and uh, poleward flux persists in these flies continuously. So, uh, Hai Fan took flies like this and asked, okay, uh, if we take a, there's a control, if we take a fly like this and then inhibit uh, uh, kinesin 13, what happens? The spindle elongates to the same rate and extent as wild type and uh, separates uh, chromosomes quite well. And this is uh, correlated uh, with a down regulation of polar flux. So, this uh, inhibition of kinesin 13 is sufficient to turn off polar flux and induce anaphase B uh, spindle elongation, bypassing the requirement of uh, whatever uh, cyclin B degradation signals to. Um, we don't think that cyclin B signals to an antibody to turn off depolymerization of the polars. Uh, what does turn it on actually came out of uh, this uh, beautiful uh, veil lab. Uh, whole genome RNAi screen that student Roy Wallman and I uh, were lucky enough to become involved in, in which all 14,000 or whatever genes in the Drosophila genome uh, were knocked down using uh, RNAi and screened for inhibition of uh, normal spindle assembly at metaphase. And among the uh, 200 or so genes that were found to be required for normal spindle assembly, some like kinesin-5 gave rise to these collapsed monopolar spindles. Uh, <coughs> some, like kinesin-5 RNAi, gave rise to abnormally long spindles. And some had this uh, short spindle phenotype. Um, in this paper, it was referred to as SSP4, and renamed by Sarah Goodwin and Ron Petrone, <coughs> because uh, this uh, is a motor that protects minusense from kinesin-13 depolymerization, so kinesin-13 can be fused to both ends and take subunits off. In the presence of patronin, uh, uh, there's uh, no depolymerization to protect it. So does this uh, turn off uh, um, kinesin-13 in the spindle? <coughs> and the answer is yes, again, using that same antibody inhibition experiment, which is way using phenotypes, and a clear inhibition of anaphase B, uh, correlating with the persistence of uh, polewood flux uh, uh, in these uh, embryos, uh, leading to this uh, uh, current model for uh, the molecular mechanism in which kinesin 5 theo slides apart these overlapping microtubules uh, in uh, uh, metaphase and anaphase A. Kinesin 13 depolymerizes these microtubules, giving rise to polewood flux, no force exerted on the poles, so the spindle maintains a constant length. Uh, turn off. Degrade cyclin B leads to uh, an activation of patronin around the poles, which turns off uh, kinesin 13, allowing the sliding motors to elongate the spindle, contributing to chromosome segregation. So, this is very nice, uh, but I just want to say one uh, final thing, and that is that this is a very, very uh, kind of static picture of what's going on. <coughs> and throughout the, uh, this work, we've um, uh, continuously used uh, mathematical modeling uh, to analyze the dynamics of the process. And this gives a much richer picture of what's going on. Uh, this work was initiated with uh, Alex McGillner, but then most of it's been done uh, subsequently by uh, my wife, Gordon Chibalekin Scully, a mathematician who I was lucky enough to meet at one of Alex's parties. And um, uh, so uh, the way this, this kind of modeling works is uh, that. Uh, if we look at an idealized uh, interpolar microtubule overlapping an anti-parallel here at the mid-zone, uh, Bull for each pair, for a, for a single pair of uh, interpolar microtubules like this, uh, writes down rate equations for the rate of pole separation uh, with time as the difference between the outward sliding rate minus the rate for depolymerization of the poles, and these are equal, there's no spindle elongation obviously, uh, for the length of the overlap zones, they change as a function of time, uh, as a function of the rate of net polymerization at the equator minus the rate of uh, sliding apart. And these two rate equations 
are coupled with a force balance equation in which the rate of pole movement against uh, viscous drag is equal to the, for the total force, which depends on the number of motors, and each motor's force velocity curve. Uh, so uh, actually, this is for a single pair, these uh, three coupled equations. Uh, we knew from EM done by Dave Sharp and Kevin McDonald when Dave was in the lab, uh, a more realistic picture of a single interpolar microtubule that's been uh, flattened out here consists of 30 microtubules per half spindle, some of them reaching the poles, some of them not reaching the poles, with dynamically unstable ends. So these, these are the poles, this is the, the spindle uh, mid zone. Uh, there are actually about 10 uh, interpolar bundles per uh, embryo uh, uh, mitotic spindle, uh, which produces a, a network of about 300 coupled equations like this that can then be solved uh, in a computer program and the results can be uh, presented in a computer simulation. So here you can see where the Kinesin 13 still are. These dynamically unstable microtubules are being slid apart. The speckles are, are fluxing polewards, but the spindle maintains a, a constant length in this flattened out interpolar bundle. And then bam, as soon as you turn off the Kinesin 13 being limb raised, the spindle elongates. And it elongates at a very linear rate, uh, similar to what we see in vivo. The model is useful because it makes predictions that we've tested along the way, such as the idea that if you down-regulate net polymerization at the equator, uh, it slows down. And so this is given the, this is the final slide I want to show, uh, a more realistic picture of how we think the Rosovla embryo spindle works here in pre-anaphase B and in anaphase B. And what the modeling uh, done by Gull, working with Ingrid, uh, Dania, Haifang in particular, uh, has told us uh, uh, that you know these Kinesin 5 motors are really very dynamic microtubule crosslinkers that conform to a classic reaction diffusion system where at any one time 90% of the motors are attached and 10% are solid. Uh, and um, this uh, behavior, this collective behavior arises because individual motors attach, take 100 nanometer runs, and then detach. Uh, when they bundle uh, uh, parallel microtubules, they can organize them into bundles, but as they accumulate in these anti-parallel overlaps, they can slide these uh, microtubules apart. During pre-anaphase B, uh, the spindle doesn't elongate because the sliding microtubules are um, uh, deep and rise to pole with flux. But then, uh, when flux is turned off by patronin uh, inhibiting kinesin uh, 13, the spindle elongates at a rate uh, that depends on the unloaded sliding velocity of the kinesin 5 motors and the extent of suppression of polar flux. All the other parameters that we look at have very little effect. Uh, uh, from the modeling, the suppression of flux requires uh, approximately a ninefold increase in the patronin to the kinesin 30 ratio. Uh, uh, Dania uh, showed that uh, at the onset of anaphase B, there's a spatial gradient of microtubule plus n catastrophe events threefold lower at the equator, which causes the microtubules to invade the overlap zone where the FIO uh, crosslinker gets uh, incorporated. And uh, this uh, model also predicted the requirement for a new nucleation throughout the spindle, uh, chromatin by, presumably by chromatin-directed assembly, as first described by Rebecca Hill, and augmin-directed assembly, which uh, Gota and others have studied which came out of the uh, Vela RNAi school. Uh, so this is, a, I think, a much richer picture of uh, what's going on, and I hope shows how uh, modeling can complement uh, experimental. I'll just leave you with this very simple model, uh, and this is what I've, we've learned about motors uh, adapted to mitosis and silicogenesis. We've had fantastic uh, mentors, collaborators, um, uh, colleagues in and outside the department that I really apologize for not being able to mention in the interest of time, but I did want to leave you with this uh, picture. Some of the great people who have worked in the lab uh, along the way, the great postdocs, uh, graduate students, technical and scientific staff, they're not all on there, I couldn't find everybody's photo, uh, but uh, uh, several of them are here. Um, I hope they feel proud of the work they did. Thank you.
multiple motor uh, cargo. Does it matter if they're acting coordinately or can they be walking? Uh, so they, my, my, understanding, understand my understanding of the reading, of the reading, the recent modeling of transport medicine is that there's negative cooperation. So that as you have multiple, and the wrong medicine, 